Hey everyone, and welcome to Battles of Noir. My name is Ian Brighton, and I'm going to be walking us through this eight-part video series. And what we're going to explore is Aztec's new domain-specific language noir and how we can use it to deploy zero-knowledge applications to any EVM blockchain. We're going to start this series off with a bit of background on what zero-knowledge cryptography is, write our own noir circuits, and ultimately implement them in a front-end application connected to smart contracts on Ethereum. The takeaway for this video should be that no matter what skill level you're at, it's easy to get started writing zero-knowledge proofs today in Noir. So looking at an overview of the series, this is going to consist of eight videos in total. Number one is going to start off with a background on zero-knowledge cryptography, explore some of the basic concepts for those who might not be familiar, and really just get us ready where we can understand what we're doing writing Noir circuits. We're also going to explore the concept of domain-specific languages, compare them to conventional programming languages, and explain what is going on behind the scenes when you're writing a zero-knowledge circuit. Video two is going to look at downloading the Nargo command line toolkit to our local machine and show how we can use it to generate proofs, verify proofs, generate verifier contracts, and also create new Noir projects. In addition to this, we will be looking at related Aztec libraries built in TypeScript that pretty much allow us to achieve the same functionality as Nargo, but within our familiar TypeScript apps for those who come from that background. Video three is going to explore Noir as a language, the underlying syntactic structure, current features that are implemented, and future features that are on the roadmap right now. Video four is going to provide an overview of the app itself, the project structure, how our repositories are organized, and show a live demo of Battleships Noir and how everything is pieced together. On top of this, we're also going to provide a little bit of background on the game Battleship, how it's played for those who aren't familiar, and why it makes a perfect demonstration of a zero-knowledge application on top of Ethereum. Video 5 is going to dive into the circuits we wrote for Battles of Snore, explain the design considerations line by line, why things were written the way they were, and also how things might change as Noir continues to develop as a language. Video six is going to walk through how the smart contracts are organized, and we'll also look at where the Noir verifier contracts are integrated into that infrastructure. Video seven, we are going to look at writing tests for Noir circuits, explore how those libraries brought up in video two, integrate what they're used for, and also show how to write tests for a smart contract implementation using Noir proofs. And then finally, video eight is going to take everything we've learned before and show how we can integrate those circuits we wrote into a front-end application built using React. And now with that overview given, let's go ahead and jump into today's video. So starting off with a background in zero-knowledge cryptography, Many of us here might have heard the term come up in the Web3 space, particularly over the past few years, but what many people might not know is that zero-knowledge cryptography can trace its roots back to a research paper in 1985 by Shafi Goldwasser, Silvio Macaulay, and Charles Rakoff. And this paper was titled The Knowledge Complexity of Interactive Proof Systems. And what it basically presented is a novel concept in cryptography where you're able to convey a piece of information about something without actually revealing what that information is. So an example is, let's say using the popular book, Where's Waldo, right? Let's say you want to find Waldo, but you don't want to reveal where you found him or what methods you used to find him. Uh, the way you would do that is you would take that page cut Waldo out and then remove everything about the page except the fact that you have the Waldo cut out. In doing that, you've successfully shown you found Waldo, but you don't know where you found him on the page and you have no idea what steps you took to find him because that information is no longer there or it's never revealed in the first place. Now, another example is let's say you have two different colored balls and you have a colorblind friend and it's your task to convince your friend that these balls are indeed different colors. Now, obviously, they're not going to be able to make this determination themselves, but what you can do 
is you can instruct them to put the balls behind their back and then on a turn-by-turn -turn basis, choose whether to swat the balls or not swat the balls and then present them to you. Now the first turn, whether they choose to swap or not to swap, there's a 50% chance in their eyes that you can guess the correct answer. But as this is repeated over and over again, let's say a hundred times, a thousand times, they're eventually gonna have to reach an asymptotic certainty that these balls are actually different colors because otherwise there's no way you'd be able to guess correctly over and over again they'd actually swapped or not swapped them. So you can see this is kind of a counterintuitive idea at first, but there's a lot of applications, uh, particularly in recent times, uh, that really make this technology promising uh, in the years to come. Initially, after the publication of the research paper and up until the 2010s, a lot of the interest in zero-knowledge cryptography was tailored towards verifiable computation. And what this is, is it's the idea of you being able to offload a computational process to another party and they submit the result back and also submit a proof that the computation was carried out correctly. But with the advent of public blockchains in the 2010s, there's many, many use cases that are ideal for zero-knowledge proofs, just given the decentralized nature. There's many ways that zero-knowledge proofs can enable privacy on top of blockchains and also scalability. And we'll touch on these concepts later in the video. But for now, we're going to move on to explaining how zero-knowledge proofs work. But really recommend, if this is interesting to you and you want to learn more of the history, do your own research because there's much, much more here than we can touch on in this video. And we'll link to some helpful resources at the bottom. So definitely check those out if you feel compelled to do your own exploration into the space. So this is going to be a surface level view. Uh, we're not going to get too in depth on this concept because it can get quite complicated. I highly recommend if you have further interest in this to do your own research and We'll provide some links at the bottom for those looking to dive in further to this topic. But for this video series, all we need to know is that a zero-knowledge interaction involves two parties, a prover and a verifier. And what the prover does is they are the ones who generate a proof, and they do so with a witness. What a witness is, is taking a zero-knowledge circuit, we provide it the set of public private inputs and outputs that generate a valid circuit where all constraints are met. We'll get into that in a later slide, but they will take this, use this information to generate a proof, and then pass it to the verifier. The verifier will then take this proof and any public inputs and outputs that the proof requires, and then be able to verify in reasonable quick time whether or not the proof is valid. Now it's absolutely essential that the prover be in control of all private inputs because that's where our ZK aspect comes in. Let's say there's a proof that involves sensitive information. You're trying to prove you're the owner of a public address and the way to do that is prove that you have the private key for that address. Now obviously it's gonna be extremely damaging if that information gets out publicly. So you want to have that private key as a private input. That way no one can gather what your private key is. And there's many other contexts where that's important as well. So zero-knowledge cryptography can be hard to grasp at first. Not many of us can say we've gone to a university and come out with a degree in cryptography. But luckily, if we want to write our own zero-knowledge proofs, we don't actually need to know the entire background and underlying cryptographic principles. We have what are called domain-specific languages. And these are languages that, similar to general programming languages, are there to let us write in a human readable format code that can be compiled down to a format that's used in zero knowledge proofs. We can think in a conventional programming language uh, when we write a program in Java, Rust, or any language of our choice. It's not run the way we write it. We write our code in a human readable format. It is then compiled down to machine code, which is something understandable to the computer, which it can then run. The process is similar in a domain-specific language. When we write a program for zero-knowledge proof, it's called a circuit, and that derives its name from the underlying structure of what the code is converted into. When we compile DSL code, it's put through a process called arithmetization, and this basically turns the code into a constraint system. Now, the makeup of this constraint system differs by proving scheme, 
but a good way of thinking about it is we are converting a program into a series of inputs and outputs going through different arithmetic gates. And we can see gate one, we have input one, input two, which are multiplied together. And then the output of this gate, output four, is the product of this multiplication. Now what the constraint system wants to do is it wants to confirm that the inputs going into a gate equal the output coming out. And once this process is repeated across all gates in the circuit, then the constraint system will be considered valid. It's worth noting that this is a very surface level overview of how constraint systems work. And if you'd like to dive deeper, we will have some documentation outlined below in the video description. But overall, um, without the advent of domain specific languages, we really wouldn't have the proliferation and innovation we have thus far with zero knowledge proofs. Um, as mentioned before, Noir is a DSL, but other examples include Circum, which is short for Circuit Compiler, and also Zocrates, among many others. Another thing worth noting is, by nature, domain-specific languages are very limited in the syntactic structure and what they support doing, and that's just because, obviously, they are a specialization language solely crafted for the purpose of generating zero-knowledge proofs. So now we're going to look at a few ways that zero knowledge can be applied to blockchains. There's two different areas where it can be very beneficial. Number one is privacy and number two is scalability through ZK rollups. Looking at the privacy side, there are a number of applications where enabling privacy can really achieve some interesting functionality. There's a lot more than listed here, but these are some of the more common applications. Number one is coin mixers. And for those who are familiar with Tornado Cash, this is the same concept as that. Uh, what a coin mixer allows is for you to, along with a group of people, deposit a fixed amount of tokens to a smart contract. And then from another address, you're able to withdraw those tokens with the path from address one to address two being completely obscured. There's no way to see what address has directly sent tokens to another address. Moving on to games. Prior to zero knowledge proofs, there really wasn't a great way to play games that require incomplete information. So let's say you have a game that requires two players and there's some piece of information that if it's known will compromise the playability of a game. Battleship is a great example. Mastermind is another. And another um, game that didn't start as a board game but is well known in the ZK realm is Dark Forest. What Dark Forest implements is a cryptographic fog of war. And what it allows is for you to hash through and discover new territory and planets to conquer. And if it weren't for this masking mechanism through the fog of war, the game would really lose all of its playability because all positions of all planets would be known to everyone and no challenge would be involved. Moving on to proof of membership, a notable example of this is Semaphore. And what Semaphore allows you to do is allows you to signal that is message on behalf of a group. So you're able to send a message on behalf of a group without revealing who you are in that group. So an example would be, say this group comprises a list of public Ethereum addresses and you prove that you're a member of this group by supplying your private key as a private input. Uh, that way you're able to prove that your private keys corresponds to one of the public keys in the provided list, but no one knows who you actually are when you send the message. And then lastly, proof of reserves. This is a way of verifying that you meet a sufficient balance for a uh, particular token or some other type of funding. And while you do this, you don't actually have to reveal how much you hold of that particular token, which is nice because I don't think many people would really like uh, if their entire account balances were known transparently as we're used to on blockchains. So that wraps up some of the common privacy applications. And then looking at scalability, we know that with zero knowledge proofs, you're able to verify a proof and see without knowing what the underlying components of the proof are, you're able to prove whether it's valid or not. So one exciting application of zero knowledge proofs is the idea of implementing them with rollups. And what a rollup is, is it's a way of bundling many transactions on a layer two and submitting them to a layer one, such as Ethereum. Through zero knowledge, 
you don't have to look at what those underlying transactions are. You're able to compute a proof to determine the validity of the transactions and then submit them on chain. The alternative to this would be an optimistic rollup. And in that case, you are hoping in good faith that all transactions in the rollup are valid and then relying on someone to dispute this. Hopefully they're able to catch whether there are invalid transactions submitted. But ultimately with a zero knowledge proof, there's the elimination of that uncertainty. But through the advent of ZK rollups, a exciting possibility that comes into view is the idea of a ZK state channel. And what a state channel is, for those who don't know, is it's a mechanism for transacting off-chain and submitting transactions on-chain at a later point in time. Through the use of recursive proofs, which we'll touch on later in this video series, uh, you can envision an entire battleship game being played off-chain and then rolled up into a single transaction put on-chain, thus eliminating the tedium of constantly having to wait for transactions to settle and go through. It really takes away from the usability of a uh, Web3 app. So this is something that is on the roadmap and will be implemented in a future version, but we'll talk about that later in the video series. So obviously we talked about applications on top of blockchains and that's where most of the interest in zero knowledge cryptography lies today. But there's many uses outside of blockchain as well. One notable example would be aircraft identification. So let's say you operate a restricted airspace in the military and you have planes coming in and out and there's a plane on a top secret mission that doesn't want to communicate technological capability, mission objective, anything like that. Through zero knowledge proofs, all you'd need to do is communicate that you are supposed to be in a specific airspace at a specific time and no questions asked. None of that information needs to be known to those at ground control. Uh, you're able to convey that all through the proof. Uh, there's also personal identification. You can imagine, let's say uh, you're going to a bar and you're asked to show your ID to show that you're at least 21. A lot of people might not like the fact that there's other information on the ID, such as their name, their home address, other identifying features, when really all that matters is the age and whether you're above 21 or not. Conceivably, with a zero knowledge proof, you could provide this information, not even convey what your age is, just show that you're above 21 and go straight into the bar with no hassle, which would be super nice. No uh, looking for fake IDs or any other trouble like that. And another personal example is Oftentimes, we're presented with situations where we have to provide our social security number to prove we are who we're supposed to be. But this always carries inherent risk, you know. There's no guarantee the party that is receiving the number is going to play nice. They could take this information and abuse it if they chose to. Imagine instead we submit a zero-knowledge proof that we are the bearer of a social security number. Then we take all the risks out of the equation because the number is not actually revealed in the first place. These examples don't exist yet, but down the line, as zero knowledge proofs continue to proliferate through society and become more common, it's conceivable that many of these use cases will begin to pop up in our everyday lives going forward. And last is the topic of verifiable computation. We touched on this topic earlier when we spoke about the background on zero knowledge cryptography. And this is just a way of proving that you've completed some computational process correctly without revealing anything else related to it. All right, and that concludes our first video. In the next video, we're kind of done with this background information preliminary, and we're going to look at downloading the Nargo command line tool set onto our local machine, show how it can be used to interact with Noir proofs, create them, etc. And lastly, we will then be taking a look at the Aztec TypeScript packages and show how they can be used along with Noir and uh, what each of their purposes is. But thanks for watching the first video and look forward to the rest of the series with you.